and start miming the accents to that music. I'd get it all out of, out of um, timing, obviously, but there you go. Right, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. I'm really looking forward to what God's got for us this morning. don't know why I'm particular, but I particularly am. He is a good God. He loves us. He's very generous towards us. There's lots of reasons to be expecting a God coming among us, and I'm particularly expecting that, so really looking forward to it. Um, we have got a time of worship this morning, um, not surprisingly. Um, we have got some notices, not surprisingly. We've got John is uh, going to be preaching, partly surprising. 50 <laughs> 50 surprisingly, eh, mate? New series, we're looking forward to that. A new series in Acts, I won't blow any other cover, but yeah, we're really looking forward to what God's got for us in that. And um, giving our best to him, declaring how great he is, enjoying his presence, pressing into the Holy Spirit. Yeah, this is good reason to be excited and expectant of God this morning. So, so yes, that's the place that I'm in. Um, Joe, you got an encouragement? Even more of an encouragement? Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Um, as I was spending time before the Lord this morning, I just really felt strongly that it's um, really important for us to be turning our eyes upon Jesus and looking to him. And he is our focus as we come here. And as we focus on him, he does the rest as we come before him as we are. He does the rest. And the words of a song came to me, and I want to pray that out over us. Um, a lot of you will know this song, um, but it just speaks about how, um, as we come before him, um, because he's in control of everything, everything else um, just fades away. The things that we've come in have distracted us and entangles us. Um, what really matters is is him and his presence. So let's let's uh, just close our eyes. I'm going to pray that you can leave them open. I've got words that are up there. Let's just focus on him and quieten our hearts before him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will, go, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are in control today as we turn to you, may the things of earth grow strangely dim in your light because of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
picture of um, a high chair this morning. You know, like a, a high chair that a, that a baby or a toddler would sit in. And um, God would say that, yeah, I, I'm providing you a high chair this morning. And it's for you to be fed really good food. It's for you to be nourished as, as a child would with their parents. And God is providing some wonderful food this morning. And all we need to do is open our mouths. <laughs> because toddlers, babies, they, they can't do it for themselves. And, and do you know what? I can't either. I have no power to do big things for myself, but God has. So let's be fed by him this morning. Let's sit in our high chair and swing our feet and throw our food around and really enjoy it. <laughs> Amen.
Father, no one compares to you. There is no one. Is there anyone like him? Will there ever be anyone like him? Has there any, ever been anyone like him? Is there anyone that could love us so completely and so beautifully as our Father? No. No, we are well loved. We are well looked after by him. Thank you, Father, that you feed us every day with good food. Thank you.
I just want to bring uh, my Bible reading from this morning, from Jeremiah 9. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast in their riches. For those of you, I'm going to just talk to the man, because <laughs> I don't know what you're like if you're anything like me. If you think you're strong enough, clever enough, fast enough, and more capable than anybody else, do not boast. Do not boast in yourself and your abilities. Do not think you're more amazing than you are, okay? But let the one who boasts, boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness in their lives, justice and righteousness on earth. For these I delight in the Lord. The righteousnesses that we have is not our own. It is from God. The Lord is our righteousness. For those who think that they saw a good deal in being saved, God saw it first. You are rescued. God has rescued you. He has pulled you out of the miry pit. He has pulled you out of the clay and he's planted your feet on solid ground. You are on the rock. He has given you a firm foundation. Do not boast. Sorry, I'm already going on this one. But do not boast in any of these things. But boast in the Lord who exercises kindness and justice and righteousness on earth. For in all these things I delight. And this morning we are delighting in God's righteousness in Jesus Christ in our lives. The righteousness we have from Jesus. God has pursued us. He has loved us. He has rescued us. Consider yourself rescued. Not the one who spots a good deal. I was struck in... What's now two previous songs? I think it was the chorus. All heaven shines with you as angel eyes behold your face. Just struck by the angels. They're obviously kind of special. But, but they're heavenly creatures. They are created. Uh, they're not holy in and of themselves. They are capable of sin and all that stuff. But they are in the presence of God. And so they shine as, as um, the, out in the presence of God. So when angels appear in the Bible, people are often like on their knees in awe and like, oh my goodness, I'm done for. It's, the angels are special, but it's because they've been in that presence of God, in that place with God. All heaven shines with you, Jesus. God, Father, Holy Spirit, as angel eyes behold your face. 
And there's like that, that invitation this morning for us. Dwell in that, in that presence with God. There's that other, otherliness, if that's even a word, an, an otherness of God, where we, we get to dwell with him, we get to spend time with him. Let's, Father God, I, I pray this morning that as we worship that you will be glorified. And I also pray, Lord, that as we worship, we will see something of who you are. We will see something of your majesty as we declare uh, the, these, these words, that we will, we will see something of who you are. Holy Spirit, come work among us, please. Be glorified, God. May, may, we, may, may we see your glory, please, Lord. Something of it, Lord, please, this morning. God, come among us. Pour out among us, please, Lord. Thank you, Father, that heaven shines with you because of you. God, we, we, we give you praise. We say, uh, as this heaven does, we, you are worthy, 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 holy, holy, holy. God, we lift you up. And Lord, we, we yeah, we want to give you glory, Lord, please. All the saints and angels before your friend.
the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, um, the, the, the incense that went up before God, the offerings that went up before God were animal sacrifices. In the New Covenant, the prayers, the, the offerings that go up before God, the incense that goes up before God, are the praise and prayers of the saints. That's the incense, that's the, the smell in the very throne room of God, even now. The prayer and praise of the saints, and we add to that, we get to add to that. God, you're wonderful. God, you're great. Uh, sorry, I, I'm praying, but I'll, let's all pray together, come on. God, you're, you're great. You're wonderful. We, we offer up our incense, Lord. We offer up our prayer and our praise, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Father God, you're great. We, we wonder at you, Lord. We, we thank you for your majesty. Father God, we glory, glorify you, Lord. You're wonderful. We praise you, God. You are worthy of it all, Lord. You're worthy of it all. picture of that high chair again and us just sitting there receiving what he has for us let's get into that position in our minds of, of receiving actually let's spend a minute just think about perhaps a child that you've seen in a high chair it's not a clean job <laughs> To, to open our mouths and receive what you have for us. Father, you're so magnificent that when we praise you, you always give back, Lord. You're so generous. get into a, a physical position of receiving as well shall we guys if someone was to hand you a present you wouldn't stand there not taking it let's let's do that mentally and physically receive from him Father, so as, as we're standing here before you this morning father will you send your holy spirit given us a picture of good food this morning. I pray that we can receive that. be people here that feel that they're they're too old they really feel weary in their body weary in their mind um, sometimes they feel like they haven't the strength to do what they want to do let alone what God wants them to do and God would say yeah receive the food that I have for you receive what I've got for you and you will soar on wings like e eagles you will run and not get weary. And there are people um, here with, with young children who at times feel very overwhelmed and maybe old children too. And God says, just eat my food. Eat my food. Come to me. Come to me and I will give you what you need. And there are people that are fighting battles in their family, in their work, with their mental health. And God says to you, come, take and eat. You don't even need to hold the spoon because I have. I've got it.
Lord, we receive, Lord, Jesus, we receive from you. Praise you, Lord, for your generosity. Lord, we receive from you. We receive all that you have to give us. Those waves of grace, those those generous waves of grace that are deeper than anything, that love that is deeper than the deepest sea. We receive from you, Lord. going to end our time of worship there. Um, I just want to pick up on one last thing that, that Lorraine just said. She referenced about soaring on wings like eagles um, and that's something that we had yesterday. Stuart brought, I think wasn't it Stuart? Yeah. Um, at the end of, of our, our time of prayer yesterday morning um, and, and the, the promise is for those who hope in the Lord. Let me read it for you from Isaiah. If you desire to, to soar on wings like eagles, if you desire to run and not grow weary and, and walk and not be faint. So even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. 
but those who hope in the Lord. And that's the key bit. I mean, we, I do anyway. I think of our oh, great soaring and, and uh, running and not being faint and all that kind of thing. But, but the focus here is those who hope in the Lord. Those who hope in the Lord. This is the promise. This is what the promise is founded upon. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will walk on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. If you find yourself weary, if you find yourself feeling faint, if you find yourself troubled by just the busyness of this world, and I'm guessing that I'm talking about 99% of us, the antidote, as it were, is to hope in the Lord. The promise is that we will soar on wings like eagles. But the, 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 the basis of that is hoping in the Lord. And I hope that's something of what we've done this morning, is to have hoped and spent time enjoying him. As we, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, you know, right from, from what Joe brought and what Lars just then brought back to us as well, that, 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 those, those few lines. It's a hoping in the Lord. The Lord. Okay. Right, Ian, you've got a testimony to bring. Yeah? Great. Morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to share, I want to give thanks to the Lord for his gracious provision. Um, right at the beginning of December last year, I started to notice one evening, I started to notice I was losing sight in my right eye. Um, went to, to A&E, initially got one diagnosis, they actually initially diagnosed stroke. However, I'm, I'm thankful to the Lord that um, the stroke physicians who examined me overturned that diagnosis to um, retinal detachment. And I got a quick, uh, I saw the urgent eye clinic the following morning at Lister and then was referred to Moorfields and within a day or two, I'd received the emergency surgery I needed. And just uh, a couple of days ago, just a couple of days ago, I went to Moorfields for my follow-up, and my retina is completely healed. So I praise the Lord for his glorious provision. And if I may, I'd just, just mention something else as well. As, as many of you know, um, I've had issues with seizures, with epilepsy for most of my life. However, uh, back in 2006, I underwent some major surgery. Yes, I had a period free from seizures. Then I had a relapse. However, the relapse, when I had a relapse of seizures, they weren't as severe as they were before. But I've also, in the last two or three years, been free of seizures. And I just want to give the Lord thanks and praise for that freedom from seizures, not just for my benefit, but from Di, for Di's benefit, because she obviously, uh, prior to that, had concerns. Uh, she was on, at times, on tender, tender hooks, you know, in terms of seizures. So I just want to give the Lord thanks and praise for his gracious provision. Amen. That's great. Okay, we've got a jam video next, because the kids are in, gig's in, so we've got a jam video. Hey everyone, hi Jam Children. This is Grace, she's come to join us for today's topic. You gonna say hi Grace? Hey everyone, do you like my hair? No hair for me. Look at it. Inside joke. Well last week, we were told of the story of Moses asking Pharaoh to set the Israelites free. After 10 plagues, he finally decided to let them go. Today's talk, is taken from Exodus chapter 14. 
So once Pharaoh gave permission for the Israelites to go, Moses and the Israelites got their belongings and set off on their journey of freedom. They took everything with them, even their sheep. That's right, even their sheep. They set off on their adventure, but they were near the Red Sea when Pharaoh changed his mind again and chased after him. That's so unfair. I know. Well, when the Israelites saw the Pharaoh chariots, they were terrified, but God told Moses to stretch out his staff towards the Red Sea. What's the staff? Well, it's a long, big stick that he held in his hand. Anyway, so Moses stretches out his staff and God sent a wind and pied the sea. The seas opened up, a dry pathway appeared and the Israelites walked straight through. Whoa, that's amazing. I know, God is so good. Uh-huh. There was a wall of water on each side of them and they walked safely across on the other side. Pharaoh and his army followed them into the sea. <gasps> God told Moses to stretch out his hand and the sea rolled back. <gasps> I know. I got slower than you though. <gasps> okay, you win. Pharaoh and his army all drowned. The Israelites were safe. God defended their freedom. So you see, even after they were set free, they were worried about their freedom again when they saw Pharaoh and the army. But God took care of that. And that's what God does for us. God really loves us. He does indeed. Just caught me on the hop there. I was expecting another few minutes. <laughs> okay, so um, last week, it was last week, wasn't it? Yes, last week we had an appeal for um, supporting with the uh, Turkey and Syria earthquake, didn't we? Um, so a figure of £2,993.45 uh, has been given and pledged, which is amazing. What's that? £6.55p short of three grand. That's great. So thank you. That is excellent. Um, I think I've got my maths right. Um, but yeah, so that, that is excellent. We will obviously be sending that off very soon. Um, if you have pledged money, then please do redeem it by the end of today. Uh, that would be great. Thank you. Um, oh, and on the on the pound signs thing, Lou, you've got a, a notice about finance. Yeah, good stuff. morning everybody um, my name's Louise Scott for those of you who don't know I'm the treasurer here at Grace Community Church so I'm just going to take an opportunity to um, just explain a few things to people who may not know the way in which the giving works here at Grace Community Church at the end of the notices most days you'll hear pe the um, notice people will say our special offering today is and you can also put some money in the pot for the general fund and the general work here. So I'm going to tell you what that is, how you do that, and what that putting money into that fund does, and how that helps us with our vision here at Grace Community Church. So it's the general giving fund. Um, some people refer to it as the tithes, but I've, um, I'm ca calling it by the general giving fund because it's an easier way to understand it. So quickly, how is Grace Community Church funded? Just to let you all know, we are a registered charity. You can look up that number. Is that working? Yes, it is. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, you can look up that number on the uh, government, uh, the Charities Commission uh, website, and you can see all the details of Grace Community Church. We uh, have to submit financial records once a year to them which is a guarantee to you guys that any money that you give to us, we have to account to, to the penny. So that's a guarantee there. We are, if you like, crowdfunded. We're crowdfunded from a small crowd back to you guys. Okay, you hear that word crowdfunded, you know, a million people give a million pounds, a uh, million people all give a pound and there's a million pounds raised. Well, we raise our money from you guys, majority of the time. 
So, over 96% of our income last year came from member no donations and the gift aid that was attached to that. The remainder, which is a very small percentage, just over 3%, came from premises usage and other contributions. So as you can see from that, we are reliant on what, what is given into that general giving fund. We are not funded by New Frontiers, the Catalyst Network, or any other organisation or investments. We are funded, self-funded. Okay, so what does the general giving pay for? Okay, so it, it pays for the Grace Community Church Centre running cost. So if you have a little look around, have a little look around, everybody, up and down. What you're sitting on, everything that you can see has been paid for by the sacrificial giving of people at this church. Everything. Okay, the organisational costs. That's the, um, well, what it takes to run us as a charity. So that includes everything, um, including licences to run us as a public building, insurance, everything that it takes to run us as an organisation. We, that includes the salaries and employee costs of all our employees. I'm not an employee, by the way. I just do this for the love of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. We also pays for our ministries and our outreach activities, which are really important. And as a church, we also believe in the concept of giving. We, can't, uh, we also believe in that. So we give out of our fund to the um, special offerings that we uh, have each week and other um, things that are worthwhile so we do give out of that as well okay so how can you donate to the general giving fund we haven't really highlighted this much before which is why i'm here today so you can do it by various methods you can give with good old cash and you put that in the pot at the back that has now changed its name to general giving just so that it coincides with what I'm saying. You can still give to this church by cheque at the moment. And you can give, as a lot of you do, by an electronic payment direct to our bank account. So those details are up there. Reference, if you want to do that, you'll see each um, week it will show a reference of HIM or ZIM. If you want to give general giving fund, just put general giving in your reference. If you at moments are sending it through with the word tithes on, that is absolutely fine. You don't need to change that. We will understand where you're giving that to. But going forward, if you just want to put general giving, if you're starting to give, please do that there. There's also two other ways in which you can give to us. You can set up a donation via church suite. Okay, if you go into your church suite um, account, you click on the menu onto the My Giving um, one that pops up there and then the donate button and you follow some quite simple instructions and it will allow you to give via that method if you haven't got an electronic payment set up before you can do that or from today we can receive your payments by card okay we can receive your set payments by chip and pin there will be a device that will appear by the pots at the back so chip and pin your card or contactless payments or most contactless cards or contactless devices can also be taken. This was rolled out um, on Friday as starting training to the ministries. And I think somebody actually paid with their phone. There you go. So we're really uh, hitting it there. So <laughs> okay, so as I said, the ministries will be uh, have this available to take payment by card going forward. Um, training started on that on Friday. I believe that went quite well for the first few people who got trained. Um, other ministry groups, if you haven't received or spoken to Connor or I about training and using this facility, please do today. We are more than happy to help and get things set up. To, this is part to allow people who come in to have every method possible to be able to pay. A lot of people these days aren't carrying cash as much as they used to. I certainly don't. I rarely have the right amount of cash and I have to pay by card. So this is just to keep uh, in touch with that. We've had a few people who have been quite embarrassed that they haven't been able to pay to our events because they were only carrying a card. We can't have that. We can't have embarrassment by people. So we are now moving into this. Okay. So I'm just going to leave it there and just leave it with an invitation to people to um, come with us on an adventure. That is why we ask you to give to the General Giving Fund so that we can fund things here.
basically, so that we can fund the salaries of people, so that we can go forward and complete the vision that God has given us in this place. And we can't do that. I know that a lot of people are um, tightening their belts at the moment, and I'm not saying to you, I want your money when you can't afford to even pay for your fuel or your food. I'm not saying that absolutely at all. But for those of you who have a heart to give and the ability to be able to do so, I would invite you to seek God and to think what it is that he would like you to give. For those of us who are new to that, can you think that you want to join with us on an adventure with us and commit financially to the work here at Grace Community Church? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lou. Great. Okay, let me wrap up very quickly. I feel like I should say, write the offering and blah, 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 but, but I've actually got a couple more beforehand. So this Wednesday, um, first Wednesday of the month, is Encounter Monthly. So up here, um, 8 o'clock we will start, um, and we will finish about quarter past, half past 9. I think we finished, 9.15. It's up on there, isn't it? Yeah, good. Excellent. It's a, they're great times. That we, We've been doing this for a long time, every month, first Wednesday of the month. We come up and we spend time worshipping God and, yeah, we, we enjoy out of that his presence and what we do out of that. So I just encourage you to, to come uh, to that if you're able to. So that means that we've not got a Bible course this week. That's been really good. We've had three so far. The fourth one will be the Wednesday after. So the 8th of March will be the fourth one. But they've been really good. Um, so now I can say this week's special offering is for Open Doors. Um, supporting Christians around the world who are persecuted for their faith. Um, so persecution of Christians is increasing around the world. Um, and as well as giving, we can support in prayer. And to help us do that, we've obtained a few copies of the Open Doors World Watch List 2023 book. Uh, it lists 50 countries where Christians are persecuted the most. Uh, what I would ask is this isn't one to take home, put on your bookshelf and leave it there. We have got some copies of these, and they'll be up the back. If you're going to pray for these countries, and if you would like information to help you pray, please take one. If you're going to take it and likely put it on your bookshelf and leave it there, please leave it so that somebody else can take it. Is that blunt enough? Yeah? Good, okay. I can be more blunt, <laughs> but I won't be. So, yeah, this, this could be a really helpful resource for those who do want more information and do want to pray about these things and for brothers and sisters across the world. So that'd be great. Right, okay, so now, yes, we do have a special offering, which as I say is open doors. We also have a, a general giving fund. Get that round me, Ed. <laughs> so that's all good as well. So uh, kids are staying in this morning, so that's our, our preschool, that's what we mean by jam. There's colouring um, stuff and activity sheets at the back if you'd like to go and grab them for your kids. Gig, which is our secondary school work, is staying in as well this morning. And John is walking up dun, 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 to preach to start our next series. Hey. about getting a card reader, eh? Into the 21st century. Whoa. Exciting stuff. Well, just as exciting as you've already been told, we are starting a new series this morning. Uh, and we are in the book of Acts. Acts is the account of what happens with the early church 
after Jesus has been raised from the dead and his followers begin to follow his instructions to go and make disciples. And we're going to see that this is a book that is full of adventure. There's miracles, there's activity of the Holy Spirit all over the place, There's lots of people uh, being converted and becoming disciples of Jesus, some individually and some in enormous crowds. And as well as that, there's opposition and there's beatings and there's arrest and there's imprisonment. There's prison breakouts and there's even a shipwreck. So it's all exciting stuff. And that's why we have called it Adventures with God. Uh, So if you've been around um, for the last few months, you will know that uh, since October last year, we have been looking at the Holy Spirit, who he is and what he does. And more recently, we've looked at uh, how we can avoid limiting um, the flow of uh, his life in our lives through not doing things that grieve him. And then last week, if you were here, David Rigby um, came and spoke about the importance of being thirsty for more of his presence in our lives. So the book of Acts is not kind of like from left field. This is right in the flow of everything that we have been looking at um, for some time. We're going to see what the activity of the Holy Spirit looks like in practice, among real people following Jesus. It's set in a different time and in a different culture, but it's the same God working through people who are just like us. Okay, bear that in mind. This, these are gonna, we're going to be looking at people who are just like us, living in a different time and a different culture, but people who are called to follow Jesus and extend his kingdom. So this morning's talk is kind of, kind of going to be um, a way of introduction into Acts. Um, and we're going to read just the first 11 verses from chapter 1. And it will appear on the screen. Is the screen still flashing a bit? Yeah. I apologise if it is. We've no idea what it is. But it's something to do with the projector. It could well be it needs a new bowl, but who knows? Could be. Sam is... <laughs> yeah, let's, let's not do that right now. <laughs> if, it gets too, if it gets too annoying, though, we'll just have to go old school and no PowerPoint. Okay, so here we go. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus... I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, He gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight." They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. 
Yes, exciting stuff, isn't it? Okay, so this morning we're going to look at this in three sections. I want to, um, by way of introduction to Acts, I want to say just a little bit about the book of Acts. Uh, then we're going to have uh, a little look at what those 11 verses have to say to us. And then I want to finish off by um, drawing out three key themes that appear right at the beginning of Acts and to look out for as we go through the book. So let's pray and we'll get going. So Father, thank you for this word. Lord, thank you that you have caused uh, this history to be recorded. And now, Lord, as we turn ourselves to look at it, would you come and speak to us, please? Lord, open our hearts to hear what you want to say to us. So we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. 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 So the first striking thing about Acts is that the opening sentence makes reference to another book. Can anybody tell me what that other book is? Yes, you are all very good. Yeah. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. That book is Luke's Gospel. So what it's telling us that Acts and Luke's Gospel actually form a pair of books. It's like part one and part two of the same book. And the author is Luke. That's not really seriously disputed by anyone. Um, Luke uh, was a Gentile, not a Jew. And he wasn't an eyewitness of Jesus' earthly ministry. He was converted uh, sometime after Jesus had ascended and the Holy Spirit had come and the gospel had started spreading out. And he became a co-worker with the Apostle Paul. And he actually gets a mention in three of Paul's New Testament letters. I'm not going to ask you what they are, because we could be here a while as we're all guessing. But he gets mentioned in three letters uh, that Paul wrote from prison as being with Paul. And we know that he travelled with Paul too, because later on in the accounts of Acts, the uh, writing style changes from they did this and they did that to we did this and we did that. So we know that Luke was with Paul for uh, some of his travels. He was an educated man. He was trained as a doctor. And um, I have read, I cannot vouch this myself, but I have read that he wrote some of the best Greek in the New Testament. So there we go. Both the books are addressed to somebody called Theophilus. There's lots of speculation as to who that might be, and we're not going to get into that this morning. And since Luke and Acts come as a pair, the introduction to Luke's gospel serves as an introduction to the book of Acts 2. So if you go to Luke's Gospel and you look at chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4, Luke lays out in the style of an ancient historical document what his purpose is in writing Luke's Gospel and Acts. And he tells us that his intention is to write a historically accurate document, something that is carefully and thoroughly investigated um, and with the facts checked with eyewitnesses. So we can be confident that what Luke has written for us here in the book of Acts is um, accurate historical record of what happened. But having said that it's accurate historically, we need to understand it's not exhaustive. This is not everything that happened to the church after Jesus went back to heaven. This is selective. So it largely covers the spread of the gospel to the north on the west from Jerusalem, uh, all the way to Rome. But the south barely gets a mention. You just get a little bit in Acts chapter 8 where an Ethiopian um, official is converted and the gospel goes to North Africa. But that's all you hear of the gospel going south and you hear nothing of the gospel going east. So it's selective and it focuses on two main characters. So you hear very little of most of the apostles, but an awful lot about Peter and an awful lot about Paul, um, and then just a few things about other 
um, other characters, but mainly Peter and Paul. Um, and it often shows how they have very similar ministries and how their ministries are very similar to Jesus' earthly min ministry. And although it's history, it's more than history. There's theology in there. Um, and the gospel is preached through its pages too. Although it's action-packed, so the next one, although it's, it's action-packed and it's fast-moving, it actually covers quite a large time period. It's about 32 years um, from chapter 1 to chapter uh, 28. Um, so it goes from the, ascent, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus to uh, Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. So about 32 years. Uh, and since it doesn't mention either Paul or Peter's deaths, which occurred around AD 64 when the Emperor Nero began persecuting Christians, it's likely that the Acts was written around AD 62. So it's, it's quite a recent book. It's written very, very soon after the events that it's recording. It's a big book. Um, it's too much to tackle in one go, so you'll be relieved to know we're not going to tackle it all in one go. Fortunately, it splits very nicely into three parts. Um, around Jesus' statement in verse 8 of what we read, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we're going to look at it in three parts. We're going to look, part one is going to be what happened in Jerusalem, the beginnings and that covers a period of two to three years. And then in part two, we're going to look at how the gospel breaks out into Judea and Samaria. Um, and that's a period of about 15 years. And then in part three, we're going to look how the gospel then extends out into Asia Minor and to Europe and effectively the ends of the earth. And that's another period of about 15 years. Um, Right now, we're going to do part one, um, and we're going to do that over the next nine to ten weeks um, or so, and we're going to do parts two and three later in the year. So that just kind of gives you a clue where we're going with this. So for today, then, let's look at those verses 1 to 11 that we read from chapter 1. And, and Luke um, begins... Uh, acts his part two with effectively a recap of the end of part one but just with a little bit more detail so he finishes with Jesus um, telling the disciples that they're going to be witnesses and the Holy Spirit's going to come and then he ascends and he starts with exactly the same thing in Acts chapter one it's a continuation of what's gone before and what he tells us in verse 1 is it's, he's writing about the continuation of Jesus' ministry. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. And the implication is he's now going to continue to tell us about what Jesus is going to do. But Jesus' ministry is about to transition to a new phase and the event that is going to mark the transition of that phase is Jesus ascension to heaven Jesus is about to return to heaven and end his earthly ministry and when he ascends to heaven he is going to be installed at the right hand of God the father as the eternal king of the universe where he is going to rule and reign over all things. Remember, we looked at this uh, a few weeks ago, at the end of Matthew 28, when Jesus commissions the disciples. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Well, that's going to happen when Jesus ascends uh, back to the Father, and he's going to carry on his mission, which is to seek and save the lost from heaven. So how's he going to do it on the earth? Well, he's going to do it through the apostles that he's chosen, empowered by the Holy Spirit, who's going to be with them and in them. 
And if you can remember all the way back to October and November lo last year, this is exactly what we looked at, Jesus telling the disciples in John's Gospel. So in chapters 14 to 16 of John's Gospel, before Jesus goes to the cross, he tells them that he's going away. They're very sad. But he tells them he's not going to leave them as orphans, but he's going to return to them through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to be another helper, just like Jesus, who is going to be with them and in them. So what we get here in these first 11 verses of Acts is that is the very last 40 days of Jesus' earthly ministry before he ascends to heaven. And in that 40 days, Jesus spends time preparing the disciples for what's to come. So in verse 3, it tells us, He presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And that gives us a clue that the resurrection of Jesus is going to be absolutely central to what is going to come next. They need to be absolutely confident that Jesus is alive because this is going to be key to them taking the gospel message out. And as we go through Acts, we're going to see that the resurrection of Jesus is what they are proclaiming. They are taking out not a message of a dead teacher. Here's some great things that it would be good if you followed from this guy who taught but is dead. But what they're taking out is the message from a living, unrisen Lord. And that's absolutely key to their ministry in the book of Acts. So he spends a lot of time convincing them, hey, I really am alive. And then in verses 3 to 5, it says he speaks to them about the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit. And then verses 6 to 8, he commissions them to carry on his ministry. So it's not surprising that the main theme of his instructions is the kingdom of God, uh, because Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom of God. In the Gospels, we see that it was central, a central theme to his ministry. By the kingdom of God, we mean the active rule of God. Jesus announced its arrival. He talked about it, and he demonstrated its values and its ways. He demonstrated its power. He told his disciples to preach it and pray for it to come. And with the first coming of Jesus into the world, God's kingdom rule has broken into this present age. But now it's going to be the disciples' job to work with God to see it extended across the earth. In the Old Testament, the prophets spoke a lot about the coming of God's kingdom through the Messiah. And it was always associated with the outpouring of God's spirit. So when Jesus t is talking to them about the kingdom, and he tells them that in a few days, they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, you can understand that they might get just a little bit excited. Because that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's telling them, wow, God's kingdom's coming. So it's not surprising that they ask him, wow, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But unfortunately, that question demonstrates that after three years of being with Jesus and 40 days of specific instruction about what the kingdom of God is, they hadn't got it at all. Everything about that sentence is wrong. When they say, are you going to restore the kingdom, it shows they're expecting a political kingdom and a territorial kingdom. When they say, are you going to restore it to Israel, it shows they're expecting a national kingdom. And when they say, are you going to do it at this time, it shows they're expecting it to happen, boom, right now. And Jesus has to correct their thinking. And let, let me just say in passing... It's ever so slightly encouraging looking at how dense and slow those first apostles were 
what Jesus is able to accomplish with such unpromising material. You can almost imagine Peter telling Luke, you know, where did Luke get this from? He got it from an eyewitness. You could almost imagine Peter saying, just I can't believe how thick we were. You know, three years and 40 days of teaching and we still didn't get it. Hey, listen, if God can use people like that, he can use every one of us in this room. Amen? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Jesus corrects their thinking by speaking to them about the Holy Spirit and what he wants them to do. See, God's kingdom is spiritual in nature. It's not territorial. It's about the rule of God expressed in men and women who have repented of their sins, put their faith in Jesus, and submitted to his rule in their lives as king. And as this happens, that's how the kingdom is extended, as more and more people come under his rule. And as this happens, the kingdom creates the church, which is the community of God's people who are living under the rule of Jesus the King. Like all kingdoms, it involves the exercise of power, but it's not military power or political power, it's spiritual power through the Holy Spirit. And the kingdom isn't spread through military force or by poli through politics, but it's spread by spirit-empowered witnesses. That's what he commissions the apostles to be. He commissions them to be witnesses. And note that he doesn't tell them that when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they're going to do witnessing. We tend to think of it like that, don't we? We tend to think the Holy Spirit empowers us to do witnessing. The Holy Spirit comes upon them to be witnesses. It's a much, much broader concept. So the Holy Spirit is going to empower them to tell of what they know and what they've experienced of Jesus. He's going to empower them to proclaim the gospel. He's going to empower them to demonstrate the kingdom through the exercise of spiritual gifts. He's going to empower them to live transformed lives and to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. And he's going to empower them to live with transformed relationships and demonstrate what God's loving community looks like. And as a consequence, he's going to empower them to transform society and culture. But it comes through witnesses who spread the gospel of peace, not through political activism, and not through military force. And then it's international in its membership. This, isn't, this gospel isn't just for Israel. This is for every nation, tribe, tongue, and people group. This gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth because it's for everyone. It's for everyone. That's how that great crowd that we... Uh, that John sees in the book of Revelation, I think it's chapter 7, from every tribe, nation, language and people group standing before the throne. That's how that's going to come about because this gospel is for the whole earth and they are witnesses to everybody. And then it's gradual in its spread, not immediate in its establishment. They're expecting the gospel to... They're expecting the kingdom to come... Boom, in one go. And Jesus says, no, it's going to come gradually. It's going to be Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, and then it's going to go to the ends of the earth. The establishing of God's kingdom is a process. God is not in the same kind of hurry that we usually are. It will happen in God's time. But the precise details of God's plan, so dates and seasons, are not ours to know. 
they're secret things that belong just to God. So don't waste your time trying to find out what they are. And don't waste your time listening to people who, can, who tell you that they know what they are. Because those dates and seasons are not ours to know. They're the secret things that belong to God. But what he has revealed to us, and what we do know, is that his kingdom is going to go to the whole world. And this command to be witnesses is going to continue all through this present age until Jesus comes back again. So that means it applies to this time and this place too. So having commissioned them, Jesus ends his earthly mission by ascending to heaven and the stage is set for part two of his mission, which is what we're going to get into as we go through these next few weeks. So I want to finish by noting three key themes that are introduced in those first 11 verses um, that I want us to keep in mind as we go through the book of Acts. And the first one is all about, what's the book about? Who is the book really all about? You see, traditionally, the title of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. And some of you in your Bibles may have on the front page of uh, the book of Acts, when you get to it, it may say the Acts of the Apostles. If you've got the ESV or the King James Version, it will, it will say that. And it is about the Apostles. It is about what the Apostles do. And it's about what some other believers do as well, but mainly it's about the Apostles. But some say... Really, the book should be called The Acts of the Holy Spirit because he's key to everything that happens. But Luke makes clear from the very first verse of the very first chapter of his book that this is about the ongoing ministry of Jesus. First and foremost, this is a book about Jesus. So, a full and correct title might be the continuing acts of Jesus by his spirit through his apostles. But that's such a mouthful, nobody would write that um, as, as the, the title. But that's really what it's about. It's about the continuing acts of Jesus by his spirit through his apostles. It's fundamentally about Jesus. He is the undisputed king. He is directing history as it unfolds. And the story of Acts is his story. And we're going to see the church created and grow, but the church is about Jesus. He is central to it, and he is its living foundation. So I wanted to say to us, if you've, if you've been around for a year or more, you will know that on, uh, on Sunday, Sunday teaching, we have focused almost exclusively on Jesus. We've been looking at Jesus, putting Jesus in front of the church. And I want to say that as we go through Acts, this is just a continuation of the same. We're actually going to be looking at Jesus and what he does by the Spirit through the apostles. Second thing to say is the Holy Spirit is key. We have been saying that for weeks as well, hopefully you've got that now, but the Holy Spirit is indispensable to every aspect of Christian life and ministry. And in Acts, we're going to see what that looks like in practice. We've already seen that the um, apostles were not superstars. And the success that we're going to see in the pages of Acts um, about how the church grew and what happened is solely due to the empowering of the Spirit and his direction. And it's got nothing to do with the plans uh, and the programs and the busyness of people. It's all about the Spirit. And we're going to see that when the Holy Spirit is in charge, the church that is produced is not static and it's not an institution, but it is dynamic and powerful and fruitful. 
and exciting. Two, the Holy Spirit is key. And then lastly, what I want us to bear in mind as we go through Acts is that, the, that it's the church that is central to God's plans. See, during the time covered by Acts, the whole known world was dominated by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was hugely powerful and it affected and dominated millions of people's lives. And in fact, it hadn't even reached its full extent at the, in, the t- in the first century in the, time, in the time of Acts. So as far as the world is concerned, Rome is the centre of the world and Jerusalem is the ends of the earth. It's right out on the fringes of the Roman Empire. But as far as God is concerned, it's the other way round. Jerusalem is the centre and Rome is the ends of the earth. You get the idea. History is God's story. And in this age, God is working out his plan through the church of Jesus Christ. The rise and fall of kingdoms and empires and governments and powerful men and women is just the backdrop to God's story. And I say that because it's very easy in our secular age, we live in a very secular um, society and culture, where the church is increasingly regarded as irrelevant and unwanted, where religion is just a personal thing. It's easy to feel that actually we're on the margins, that we are pushed to the edge of what is happening in the world. But that's not how God sees it. His purposes don't change, and he doesn't have a plan B. And every local church that is alive to God and obedient to his leading is at the centre of God's purposes in the society and the culture where he has put them. And whether we as individuals and together as a community of God's people believe that will actually affect how we live our lives, what we prioritise and what we regard as important to us. So let me finish um, this introductory talk by just saying that as we go through this series on Acts, let's expect God to speak to us. Okay, let's expect God to speak to us through the written word. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us through the written word. And let's also be open to God speaking to us through the prophetic word too. Let's be asking the Lord as we go through uh, this book, what does it mean for us as the church in this time and place? What what is this saying to us about his plans and his purposes for us in this season? And I'm I'm confident, we're we're confident as as, as elders that um, as as we look at this book and we allow it to speak to us, that that God is going to speak into, into this church and his purposes and direction for us in this time. So I'm going to pray and ask God to do that. Um, And then the band's going to come back and we're going to sing a song to close. So Father, thank you again for the book of Acts. Lord, thank you that you have recorded what happened when Jesus returned to heaven and the Spirit came and Jesus' mission continued on earth through his people. Lord, we ask, please, that as we consider these things, Lord, you will capture our attention and you will speak to us about what it means for us uh, in our time and in the place where you have caused us to be. Lord, that we might become 
everything that you have purposed us to be. And Lord, that we might accomplish for your glory everything that you have planned for us to accomplish. Lord, come uh, and empower us. Come and inspire us. Come and, let's say, come and capture our attention, Lord. May, we, may your priorities be our priorities, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lord. John's just going to get his other hat on, his guitar playing hat. These series that we've just done have been really good, haven't they? They've been really good. I'm looking forward to this new one. We're going to sing um, In the Darkness We Were Waiting. If you'd like to stand if you can, that would be great. And this is our last song. If um, you want to be prayed for this morning, before I forget to say at the end, um, there will be people lurking over there. If you can't get there, just wave your hands and they'll, they'll come to you. Lurking.
God, we thank you that you have caught us up in your plans and purposes. Father, we thank you that over the coming weeks we will see your plans and purposes begin to unfold. And Father, thank you that we continue to, to pick up that baton ourselves, Lord, and to march on with you. Father, I pray that you would uh, inspire us afresh by your spirit as we look through these next few weeks uh, at the early uh, acts of, of, the ch of your church. Uh, Father God, I, I pray that you would get the glory. I pray, Father, that we would see an expanse of your kingdom uh, in this church and in the surrounding areas and the people and families that we know. Father God, we thank you that you have commissioned us as you commissioned them, Lord. God, thank you. I, I pray, Father, that you would be glorified, Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Good. Okay, that's the end of this morning's meeting. Thank you. Thanks to those who've been online with us. Yeah.